Today we're going to be doing an experiment in titration. And a titration is basically a way of determining the amount of a substance in a solution. And a titration is pretty straightforward. What we do is we add a solution that has a known concentration of one substance to a solution that has an unknown concentration of the other substance. I'll cover this in great detail in the following pre-lab video. So I'm just going to give you a basic overview now. Then you can watch that video, and we'll head on into the lab and get to work. But essentially, it works this way. You have two substances, A and B. We know how much the concentration of A is, but we don't know the concentration of B. We do, however, know what the stoichiometry is of the reaction. So, for example, if it's a one-to-one -one reaction, we know that for every mole of unknown B, we would need a mole of unknown A. The way a titration works is pretty straightforward. Our unknown solution will be in an Erlenmeyer flask. And our known solution will be in one of these burettes. A burette is a device that allows us to measure um, quantities of liquids very accurately. We can measure the volume in this burette to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter, so we can get a very accurate measure of that. What we'll do is we will simply add the known solution of A to the unknown solution of B, and as soon as we've added just the exact matching amount of moles of A, we will stop, measure the volume that we used, and from that we'll be able to calculate the moles of A, and that will tell us, of course, the moles of B. In order to know when the reaction is done, we're going to add something called an indicator. In this particular experiment today, we're going to be measuring the amount of calcium in a sample of hard water. Now, you may remember when we did our cabbage juice lab, we used cabbage juice as an acid-base indicator. It turned different colors depending upon the pH. For calcium, we have a special indicator called Ariachrome Black T. It just happens to be a chemical compound that's very sensitive to calcium. As you'll see when we go into the lab, in the presence of calcium, it turns bright red. If the calcium is absent, it turns a lovely blue, sort of like the red on the clamp and the blue on our burette. So we're going to be adding some of that indicator to our sample. And when the calcium is there initially, of course, it will look red. We will simply add our reactant from the burette, reactant A, until the color just changes from red to blue, and at that point we will know that the reaction is complete, and then we can use the volume that was required to determine the moles of the unknown in our solution, and thus we can figure out the concentration. As I mentioned in the introduction, our goal today is to measure the hardness in a sample of water. So what exactly makes water hard? It doesn't feel hard. It's not like concrete or something. Hardness is a measure of minerals or metals that are present in the water. There's a lot of different elements present in tap water. Tap water is not pure. For example, there's always calcium in water, and calcium is the main thing that causes water hardness. When we measure the hardness of water, we're normally measuring the amount of calcium in a sample of water. Magnesium, being chemically very similar to calcium, also contributes to water hardness. And we'll talk in a couple of minutes what exactly we mean by that. There's other elements in water as well. We have potassium ions. There are sodium ions. Those are pretty harmless. We have some heavy metals like manganese, even chromium-6, which is not a very safe substance. If you've ever seen the movie Aaron Brockovich, it was all about uh, PG&E contaminating groundwater with chromium-6, which can be very dangerous in high concentrations. However, in Stockton's water supply, if you read the report from the, from the water department, the amount of chromium-6 is much lower than is required.
all water contains lots of different elements. There's lead and mercury. All those elements are present, but usually in very tiny amounts. So even a poisonous material is not dangerous if we keep the concentration low enough. So why do we care if water's hard? Well, it's because of things that calcium can do in water. For example, calcium ions in water will react with carbonate ions to form calcium carbonate, which is commonly known as limestone. And limestone is basically cement. Carbonate ions can form when carbon dioxide from the air dissolves in water. And if you have calcium in your water, it can form these limestone deposits. It can, they're, while they're not dangerous, they can be very annoying. For example, if you've ever seen glasses or silverware that you've washed them many times and they've got this sort of white film in there, that's a layer of limestone. And it, it's a pain to get rid of. The good news is usually something like vinegar will take that out. Things like calcium carbonate are soluble in acids, and so you can remove them, but it's inconvenient. You may have noticed your faucets. If you have hard water, you'll get this crusty buildup, not only on the top of the faucet, but down underneath as well. Again, that's limestone. The other thing that calcium will react with is soap. If you're using soap in the shower, in your washing machine, doing dishes, calcium ions love to react with soap, and soap is basically just a polyatomic ion with a negative charge. The calcium will react with two of the soap ions to, fo to form a solid precipitate. It's sort of a greasy solid, commonly known as soap scum. Doesn't sound like the kind of thing you probably want. So why is soap scum a problem? Well, this is what happens when you put soap in hard water. The calcium causes the soap to precipitate and form this sort of greasy scum, and now the soap can't do its job. Soap has to be soluble in water in order to clean things, and this won't work. You put soap in soft water, where the calcium has been removed, and it foams up and bubbles and forms suds, and that tells you that that soap is going to be able to do its job and clean. If you've ever looked at your shower and you have that sort of hazy white layer in there that you can't see through very well, that's soap scum. The soap from your shampoo and your body wash and whatever reacts with the calcium in the water, ends up spraying and splattering on the side of the shower and slowly coats it. And of course, if you're in the shower or you're washing your hair in the sink, you're going to end up with soap scum in your hair. I know that sounds sort of gross, and it is. That's why I like to wash my hair in soft water. Each of your hairs is covered with a thin little layer of this greasy soap scum. If you ever wash your hair in soft water, you may have noticed it tends to be fluffy and fly away. And the reason is it's the hairs aren't sticking together. When you wash your hair with hard water, it doesn't fly away because all the hairs are basically glued together by the soap scum. Fortunately, it's not difficult to remove hardness from water. With, to do that, we use a device called a water softener. And I've had one of those since I was a kid. My parents had a water softener because the water in my hometown was very hard. A water softener is a pretty simple device. There are some resin or plastic beads in a cylinder, and those plastic beads are coated with sodium ions. When you pass your hard water through there, the sodium ions are released and the beads collect all of the calcium ions, and sodium ions don't cause any problems. Sodium ions don't precipitate. There's also some salt in here, and the salt is used to return sodium to the beads once they get full of calcium. If you take a look at this diagram, here's our resin bead initially. It's totally coated with sodium ions, and that's great. As you pass your hard water through that has all of these positive two calcium ions, those calcium ions are very attracted to the bead. Every time a calcium ion sticks to the bead, two sodium ions are released, and eventually the uh, beads get coated with a lot of calcium, 
but the water leaving the water softener only has sodium ions, and sodium doesn't precipitate with carbonate, it doesn't form soap scum. Once the beads have become coated with quite a lot of calcium, they don't work so well anymore. So during the night, your water softener will regenerate. And what happens is water will pass through that salt in the water softener, and that salt water will wash over the beads, and it will kick loose all of the calcium ions and replace them with sodium ions. And all of that water with the calcium in it will simply be washed down the drain, by the next morning, when you're ready for water, you have nice fresh beads again, and you'll be getting good soft water. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to be determining the hardness of a water sample using a technique called a titration. So what exactly is a titration? Well, in basic terms, it's a way that we can measure the concentration of a substance in a solution. We have a substance that we know what it is, but we don't know how much we have. Titration is a very common technique that chemists use to measure a lot of different things. The most common type of titration is called an acid-base titration, and we'll be doing one of those later in the semester, where we measure the amount of hydrogen ions in a solution. We can even measure things like the amount of nitrogen in a soil sample. That's useful information for farmers when they're determining whether they need to fertilize their fields for particular crops. And of course, today, our goal is to measure the amount of calcium in a sample of water. There's a few terms that you should know. The titrant is the known substance. This is the, the substance whose concentration we know. In order to measure an unknown, we have to have a known to compare it with. The titrant we'll be using today is called EDTA. We need an analyte. That's essentially our unknown sample. And in this case, that will be calcium. So we'll be using the EDTA to determine the amount of calcium in our water sample we'll need a balanced chemical equation because we have to know the stoichiometry of the reaction. For example, if one EDTA reacts with one calcium, then we have a one-to-one -one ratio, and that tells us that however many moles of the EDTA we used, the calcium would be the same. If the ratio was, say, one calcium to two EDTA, then, however much EDTA we had, the moles of calcium would simply be half of that. So we need to know that balanced equation so we know what the stoichiometry will be. We need an indicator. When we did the uh, cabbage juice lab, we used cabbage juice as an indicator. It changed different colors depending on the pH of a sample. In this particular case, we're going to use an indicator called Areochrome Black T. Cabbage juice is sensitive to hydrogen ions. Areochrome is sensitive to calcium ions. In the presence of calcium, it turns a lovely red color. And when calcium is absent, it's a lovely blue color. And finally, we need to know the end point of our titration. As soon as we've added just enough of the EDTA to neutralize the calcium, we want to stop and then measure how much EDTA was required. And to do that, we need to know the end point or when the reaction had just finished. And that's what the indicator will tell us. When the area chrome turns from red to blue, we will stop adding our EDTA and then we'll take our measurement. In general terms, a titration involves a reaction between A and B. We have our titrant and our analyte, and they will form two products. What we want to figure out is the number of moles of A and the number of moles of B. If our stoichiometry is 1 to 1, then if we can calculate the number of moles of the titrant that we used, because its concentration is known, then we can calculate the number of moles of B that were present in the solution. To calculate the moles of A, 
we only need to know two things. How much volume of A did we add? And what was the concentration of A? If we multiply the volume times the concentration, we'll have the moles of A. The concentration of A is known, because that's our titrant, and we're going to measure the volume by using our indicator to tell us when we've just reached the endpoint. The moles of B works the same way. The volume of B that we used in our sample, multiplied by its concentration, will give us the moles of B. So we can write this equation pretty simply, and that is that the volume times the concentration of A equals the volume times the concentration of B. We know the concentration of A. That's a given. We're using a standard solution. The volume of A we're going to measure, and the volume of B we're going to measure. So the only thing that we don't know is the concentration of B, so we can simply rearrange and solve for that, and that's what our goal is today. To measure out our titrant, the EDTA, we're going to use a burette, as I showed you in the introduction. Burettes are graduated in one-tenth of a milliliter increment, so we'll be using a 25 milliliter burette, and it's marked off in tenth of a milliliter increments, so we can estimate it to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter. At the bottom of the burette there is a stopcock. This stopcock has a hole going through it, and that hole allows um, liquid to pass through. If you close the stopcock, it will stop the liquid from flowing. This is the basic setup we'll be using. We have our burette filled with the EDTA solution. We have our Erlenmeyer flask that contains our hard water sample. And then we have our Areochrome black tea indicator, which will start out red when there's calcium present, but as soon as we reach the endpoint, it should turn blue. Let's go ahead and work through a sample titration. The first thing we'll need, of course, is our balanced equation, so we know the ratio of calcium to EDTA, and it appears that it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Thus, however many moles of EDTA we use, the moles of calcium will be the same. We'll start out by measuring a 25 milliliter sample of our hard water in a graduated cylinder, and then we'll transfer that to our Erlenmeyer flask. Because some of the sample will be left behind in the cylinder, we'll go ahead and rinse the graduated cylinder with some deionized water and add that to our flask as well. And now the entire 25 mil sample should be in the Erlenmeyer flask and ready to titrate. We'll add our indicator and then carry out the titration, and we find that it required 4.85 milliliters of our 0 0.01 molar EDTA solution to reach the endpoint, and now we want to determine the hardness of our water sample. We'll begin with the volume of EDTA. As we talked about a moment ago, to get moles we need to multiply the volume times the concentration, but the volume has to be in liters. So our first step will be to convert the milliliters of EDTA into liters. Then we can multiply it by our given concentration, and that tells us how many moles of EDTA were required. As we mentioned previously, of course, the number of moles of EDTA will be the same as the number of moles of calcium. When water hardness is calculated in general by any laboratory, it's normally based on calcium carbonate. So we're going to do our calculation based on that number of moles of calcium carbonate. To get the uh, water hardness, we need to know the mass of calcium carbonate in the sample, because water hardness is normally measured as the number of milligrams of calcium carbonate in every liter of our sample. We can first, then, convert the moles of calcium carbonate to grams by determining its molar mass, and then we can convert that to milligrams, and that will give us the number of milligrams 
of calcium carbonate in our sample. We now know then that there are 4.85 milligrams of calcium carbonate in 25 milliliters. We need to know how many milligrams there are in a liter. So we'll simply convert the milliliters into liters and that comes out to be 194 milligrams per liter or it's commonly referred to as 194 parts per million because milligrams in a liter, a liter of water, weighs a thousand grams, and so one milligram is one millionth of that, thus the term parts per million. So that covers everything you should need to know. Let's go ahead and head back into the lab and now carry out our titrations. The first thing we need to do is to prepare our burette. Normally we would use a special clamp for this, but I'm going to use just a regular laboratory clamp because it will be easier in this particular case. Now, we can't assume that our burette is clean to start with, so we need to make sure we clean it out. This little device here is called a stopcock. If you move it in the vertical position, it lets liquid run through, so we want to make sure it's horizontal to start with so that no liquid gets out. The first thing we'll want to do is to rinse it out with some water. So I'm going to put some water in here, and I'm going to sort of swirl the burette around. I want to rinse the side down very well, and then we'll just have a waste beaker here that we can rinse it out. So we'll open the stopcock, and we'll let the water drain out. That way, if there's any contamination in there from a previous experiment, we'll get rid of that. If you get tired of waiting for it to run out, of course, we can also pour it out the other way. We'll do two rinses just to be sure. And notice I'm, gonna, I'm rotating the burette around to rinse the sides down completely there. And we'll go ahead and drain that a little bit more. And we'll pour out the rest of that water. And now there should be nothing in the burette except deionized water. There's still some deionized water on the sides. There's a little puddle of it down below there. We can't get it all out. The titrant, or the substance we're going to be using that has a known concentration, is called EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. It happens to love calcium. So in the burette, we're going to be putting EDTA. This EDTA has been prepared to have a very specific concentration. So we're going to carefully add some EDTA to the burette. Now the problem, of course, is as soon as we added that EDTA, there was still some water in here, and it diluted the EDTA, messed up our concentration. So I'm going to swirl this around a bit to try to get any water out of there and then we'll let this drain out. So this should push any of the water that was left in the burette out the bottom. We want to make sure there's nothing inside this burette but the EDTA. And we'll go ahead and we can pour the rest of that out. And let's do another rinse just to be sure. We want to make sure there's nothing in here except the EDTA. There we go. So we'll shoot a little through the bottom, clean that out, and then we'll sort of rotate it as we drain it out the top. That should rinse out everything that's inside. So now there should be nothing in our burette except EDTA. Now we can go ahead and fill the burette. So we'll go ahead and pour in EDTA to get ready to do our titration. Now it doesn't matter where you begin the titration. So I filled it up between the one and the two milliliter mark here. I'm going to go ahead and clamp it back in. And then whatever the reading is, that can be our initial value. So if I look at this, I'm going to read the burette like I would read a graduated cylinder. And I'll show you a close-up of this in a moment. But it appears that we are at 
0.4 milliliters, that will be our starting point. This is the initial volume of the EDTA in the burette. Take a reading and record the value in your lab book. The next step is to prepare a sample of an unknown. Since this is your first time doing a titration, we want to begin with a sample of calcium whose concentration is known. This particular calcium, this is our standard hard water sample, it's supposed to be 250 parts per million of calcium. And with the concentration of EDTA, it should require just a little bit more than 6 milliliters of the EDTA solution to neutralize it. So we're going to check and make sure that we can do the titration correctly by getting that value, or at least close to it. We're going to carry out the titration in a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, and we want to use approximately 25 milliliters. To measure the sample of calcium, we're going to use a 25 mil graduated cylinder. Again, we need to make sure it's clean. So I'm going to rinse it out a couple of times with some deionized water just to make sure there's no calcium in there from a previous experiment. Now I'm ready to measure out my sample of test hard water. As soon as I add my very carefully prepared calcium to the cylinder, what just happened? Well, what happened is the water that was left in the bottom of the cylinder has diluted the calcium, and that's not good. So let's discard this first sample. In fact, like we did with the burette, let's go ahead and rinse our graduated cylinder out a couple of times just to be sure there's nothing in here but our calcium sample. Now we can go ahead and measure out approximately 25 milliliters. It doesn't have to be exactly 25. We'll just simply need to get a reading of that. And it looks like I have got that right on the nose. I managed to get it right on. It is just exactly on 25 milliliters, so that's good. Now we want to transfer that sample to the flask. Now the same problem we have with the flask is it might have contamination in it. So I'm going to rinse the flask out. We'll do that a couple of times with the ionized water. Now the good news is it doesn't matter if there's extra water left in here because this water has no calcium in it. All we care about is getting all 25 milliliters of our test sample into the Erlenmeyer flask. Now when I pour it in, of course, I didn't get all of it in there because there's still some liquid in the bottom of the cylinder. So I'm going to simply fill that cylinder up with about 25 milliliters of deionized water. And you're probably thinking, oh my god, he's going to ruin the concentration. Well, it's not a problem. I can add all the deionized water I want to the flask it still only has the original 25 milliliters of calcium. Adding deionized water doesn't make any difference. This is the volume of our calcium carbonate sample for the first titration. Now we're just about ready to carry out our titration. But before we can do that, we need to add our indicator. This indicator is not very soluble in water. So in order to make the indicator dissolve in water, we're going to add a buffer solution. This is mainly just a solution of ammonia. We're going to add 10 drops of that to adjust the pH. It doesn't have to be exactly 10 drops. If it were 12 or 7, it would still work fine. The key thing is we have to adjust the pH so that our indicator will dissolve. Now, when students do this experiment, the number one problem they have is adding too much indicator. This indicator is extremely colorful. It takes a very tiny amount. In order to help people not put too much in, I've actually mixed this with salt. It's 90% salt and only 10% indicator. 
And even then, the amount of indicator we need is going to be a very tiny amount. I just put a few little specks onto the spatula. So let's sprinkle in a few specks of indicator here. We'll swirl it around. Ooh, see that lovely red color? We want it to be dark enough, but not too dark. That is probably an excellent color. We can put maybe just a couple more specks. We don't want it to be so dark that it's hard to see. So now you notice that we've got that red color that indicates the presence of calcium. We're now going to add to that our EDTA solution until it just turns blue, and then we can take a reading from our burette and we'll be able to determine the amount of EDTA required and thus the hardness of the water. Now we're ready to begin our titration. Normally, as you're adding the EDTA solution, you would swirl the flask to make sure that the chemicals are mixing. This reaction has about a two-second delay, so we have to add it slowly and watch carefully for that color change. To make it easier for us today, we have something called a lighted stirring plate. First of all, it has a light built in, which means it'll be much easier to see the color change. And it also has a magnetic stirrer inside, so I'm going to place a magnet inside my flask, turn that on, and now I won't have to actually swirl the flask because the magnet will do that for me. That magnet is in there spinning around now. So let's go ahead and begin to add the EDTA. I'm going to rotate this around to make it convenient to handle the stopcock. Now, when you're doing a titration, if you already have a good idea of where the color change should occur, you can add this, the titrant fairly quickly. So I'm going to start adding my EDTA solution. I know it should take about six milliliters or so, so there's one milliliter. There's two, and notice it's still red. There's three. When it gets close, I will slow down. There's four. And there's five. All right. I've added about five and a half milliliters, so I'm getting close to where I want it to be. So now I'm going to slow it down and just add it a single drop at a time. We'll open the stopcock very carefully. There. Now we have individual droplets falling in. We're going to watch. As soon as it begins to turn sort of a purple color, we know it's just about ready. So let's be standing by here. I think we're getting close. All right. Now you can see the color has sort of become purple. That usually means we're about one drop away from the end. In fact, there's a droplet on the end of the burette. I'm going to shoot that down into the flask and see if that's enough to get it blue. It looks like it wasn't quite enough. We need about one more drop. So let's try to add a single drop of EDTA. All right, let's see if that was enough. And lo and behold, it turns that lovely blue color, and that means that we are at the end of our titration. So now we can turn off the stirrer, and we'll simply take a reading of our uh, graduated cylinder, and we can determine how much EDTA was required. Here's a close-up view of the blue color we get at the end of the titration. And this is our final burette reading after the first titration. This will also be our initial burette reading for the second titration. This is the volume of our standard calcium carbonate solution for the second titration. All right, we're ready to do the second trial with our standard calcium carbonate. The first trial looked like it worked real well.
This time, instead of 25 milliliters, it was only 24 milliliters, so it should take a little bit less, still around 6 milliliters of EDTA. So let's go ahead once again and add it fairly quickly until we get maybe 5.5 milliliters, and then we'll slow down. So there's one, two, three, four, five, that's about five and a half. So let's go ahead now and start doing it a drop at a time again, like we did before. We'll watch for that color change. It should again turn purple, and then one drop later, it will turn blue. Getting fairly close here. Are you ready? Looks like a subtle bit of a color change. All right, it's turned purple. Let's see if it gets all the way to blue here. Looks like we're going to need one additional drop here. That ought to do it. And there it is. We have that lovely blue color. So that will be the end of our second titration. And this is the final burette reading for our second titration of our standard calcium carbonate solution. Now we're ready to begin testing our unknown hard water sample. So I've refilled the burette to begin the three trials that we'll be doing. So be sure and record this initial volume of the burette. This is the sample of calcium carbonate we'll be using for our first trial of the unknown sample. Now that we've completed our two trials of the known calcium sample, it's time to test an unknown. So we have an unknown here. And in this case, we really don't know how much EDTA is going to be required. So there's two ways you can approach this. Uh, number one, you can add one drop at a time slowly until you reach the end point, but that could take a very long time. The other approach is to do one sort of quick and dirty titration just to get an idea of where it's going to change, and then we'll go back and do two trials very carefully. So I think we're going to use the latter approach here. I'm going to add the EDTA pretty quickly, and as soon as I see the color change, I'll turn it off. And of course, at that point, we will have overshot a little bit, but at least we'll have an idea of where the end is going to take place. And then in the next trial, we'll sneak up on that one drop at a time. So let's go ahead and turn on the stirrer. And we'll just start adding the EDTA rapidly this time. And it looks like we've got it. So it's turned blue. We probably added a bit more than we needed. So we'll take a measurement here in just a moment and let's see how much we used and then we will do a, two more titrations and this time we'll come up on it much more slowly. This is the final burette reading for our rough trial of the uh, unknown calcium carbonate sample. And this will also, of course, be the initial burette reading for our next trial. I've gone ahead and measured out a sample of the unknown calcium carbonate solution for our first official trial. Now that we've done our uh, trial run for the unknown, and we, it looked like it took just a little bit less than 2 milliliters of EDTA, so this time we'll sneak up on it. We'll, we'll maybe add a milliliter or a milliliter 
and a half and then go drop wise. So let's go ahead and start the stirrer here. And let's start adding. This time we'll do it still a little bit slower. Right, there's half a milliliter. There's one milliliter. Now I'm going to slow down the rate here. We'll let the drops go in more slowly and sneak up on it. We're at about one and a half milliliters. It looks like it's getting close. There's our purple color. Let's see if that is just enough to turn it to blue. And it did indeed take a bit less. It looks like it's maybe just over one and a half milliliters at this point. We'll take a more accurate reading of that in just a moment. This is the final burette reading for this trial, and we'll also use this as the initial burette reading for our next and final trial. This is the sample of our unknown calcium carbonate for our final trial. Let's do one more trial of the unknown, and then we can average those two. So that first rough trial we did of the unknown, we're not going to have to do any calculations for that one. That was just to give us an idea of where our endpoint would be. And from the first trial, it looks like it was just over one and a half milliliters, so we should probably expect something similar this time. So let's go ahead and turn on the stirrer, and we'll add it slower. Right, there's half a milliliter. Should be somewhere around one and a half. There's one milliliter. Let's keep an eye on that color. Looks like it's just starting to change. It's purple and it's turned blue. So it looks like we have an endpoint again. And it looks like it took just about the same amount. So let's go ahead and uh, take a final reading of the burette, and that will be all the data you'll need for the experiment. Here's the final burette reading for our last trial. You have all the data you need now to go ahead and calculate the water hardness for each of the samples and answer the questions at the end of the lab.